Uh, thank you, Coach Jennings, for joining me today. Coach Jennings is currently the offensive coordinator at um, Wisconsin Whitewater. Uh, Coach, if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving people a little brief background on kind of how you got to Wisconsin Whitewater. Yeah, so I uh, started my playing days up at Bemidji State um, University in northern Minnesota. Um, after a couple of years, I transferred a little closer to home to a small D3 school in uh, Jacksonville, Illinois, um, named Illinois College. I, I had the opportunity, awesome opportunity to play both football and basketball there. Um, met some awesome people. Was co I was able to be coached by um, some people that are still um, my mentors to this day, which have greatly shaped my coaching background. I'm, I'm very thankful to, to all of their, their efforts to try to shape me into a, a, a decent human being and a decent, uh, a decent educator. Uh, from there, I went and uh, cut my teeth at Iowa Wesleyan College, the birthplace of the air raid. Um, I think I was in the same office uh, that uh, you know, Mike Leach and Hal Mummy were in and maybe even some of the same paint when I first got there. So uh, <laughs> um, it, it was a great learning experience. I coached some great kids. Um, some great young men. Uh, it's awesome. I still have a couple of those guys, many of those guys that will reach out um, after a big win, no matter where I've been, whether it's here, Rhodes, Carroll, and just say congratulations. And I, um, as a young coach, I couldn't ask for, for a better group of guys to, to coach and help me to help me develop. Um, from there, I uh, went to Carroll University. I was there for five years, which is in Waukesha, Wisconsin. We had a really nice run. Um, and it got to uh, the point where I, I was really confident that, that could be somewhere I'd be for, for a really long time. Um, but then spring or the winter of my fifth year there, uh, one of my good friends and, and mentors who, who did coach me at, uh, who was a defense coordinator at Illinois College, actually got the head coaching job at Rhodes College, a high academic school in Memphis, Tennessee. So I, I, I uh, packed up, packed the family up and moved nine hours south and and loved it uh, it was awesome uh, recruiting a high academic highly selective institution it was awesome uh, the barbecue was awesome right uh getting to know the southern culture a little bit more was was, was fantastic for for my development and, and i think my family really enjoyed our time there but then um an opportunity came uh one winter uh two years ago three years ago uh for wisconsin whitewater to come take over the offense at at one of the premier schools in Division Three football, um, six-time national champions, and, and I just couldn't say no. And even though I loved it at, at Rhodes and loved my position at Rhodes and loved the people at Rhodes, uh, I felt like this and my family felt like this was just the best opportunity for me to continue to grow as a coach. And um, I, I have to put a little caveat in there. If, if there's any young coaches that listen to this, the uh, my foot in the door at Wisconsin Whitewater was – when I, uh, working camps at Carroll University, I'd come over and work the summer camps at Wisconsin Whitewater for basically pennies on the dollar and got to know uh, Coach Kevin Bullis through camps, I developed a relationship uh, through, you know, just through summer camps, perimeter camps and whatnot. And um, so I was able to climb his list of people to call when he did have an opening. So uh, without, without working tirelessly and long hours and through the through the heat, uh, I, I probably wouldn't be um, in charge of, of the uh, offense here at Wisconsin Whitewater. Now, uh, can, can I, I'll, I have two questions just off that. Uh, the first one is, when you got the OC job at Wisconsin Whitewater, did you bring in your offense? Did you just take over their offense, have to learn their terminology, or did you kind of meld between the two? That's that's a great question, and it's actually a question I've got got several times. I'm it would be very difficult. I'm not saying that I'd be incapable. It would be very difficult for me to take over somebody's offense. I am that, I feel that strongly about the structure of what we do. And uh, I'm that confident in the success it can have. Uh, now that being said, um, you know, there's a, I, I can't say that as an absolute, right? But that's just, it would be very difficult for me to take over somebody else's offense. I would want to be able to put some, make it my own in some way, shape, or form. Um, coach Bolas is awesome. He gives me complete autonomy, gives us complete autonomy as assistant coaches to do our job. So his statement to me when I interviewed was, I'm going to be the banks of the river. You're not going to run triple option and you're not going to run five wide fun and gun. And if you stay in between those two, <laughs> those two uh, banks of the river, you can run anything in between. You just better have success. And I said, well, my man, that, that sounds like a deal. <laughs> so I was able to uh, implement my offense. Uh, the good thing is, is, you know, our offensive line coach 
um, did work uh, for me uh, at Carroll. So he had a pretty good basic understanding of what we were going to try to do. So there wasn't a massive learning curve for the entire offensive staff. Now, you mentioned you've been offensive and coordinator a couple different places. How has your offense evolved over those many destinations and years um, during, during your time as an offensive coordinator? So the structure and the play calls have stayed very, very similar. Um, you know, inside zone has been inside zone has been inside zone. Um, and how we run it is very similar. The amount we run it is 100% player dependent. And, you know, I start at what can we do up front and what can we do at the quarterback position? And then we expand from there and try to design up the offense and the play calls around the kids that we have uh, on the field. We're lucky at the college level that we can recruit um, at the same, in the same sentence, we're still division three. We're not throwing out money. So we don't always get the exact kid we're looking for. And very few programs do, if you're not one of the, you know, <laughs> one of pure bloods up, up in the power five. Right. So, um, so for us, uh, you know, we do try to build around our offensive line and our quarterback and depending on that um, sort of uh, helps us, helps guide us through the season. So for example, uh, you know, a couple of years at Carroll, we had just an absolutely elite running back. And so we were very, you know, run dependent there, same offensive scheme. We just lined up in a few heavier formations and, um, you know, tried to jam the ball down people's throats. Uh, one of my years, at, at, both my years at Rhodes, our quarterback was an elite talent. He could fly, he could run, he had a cannon for an arm. So we built it around PJ, right? And, you know, at, I think my second year there, he was second in the nation in total yards, and averaged 260 yards passing, 110 yards rushing or something like that. So it's all going to be quarterback dependent. My first year at, at here at, at Whitewater, we had a kid that had a cannon of an arm, wasn't a great runner, didn't love to be outside the pocket. So we did a lot, a few more smoke and mirror type plays to give the illusion that he's a run threat when he probably, you know, by, by fifth game of the season, everybody knew Cole wasn't going to run anywhere, but he's <laughs> going to throw the ball a mile. Um, so we just, that's more how we evolved in, um, than system. The system stays the same. It's just the play calls uh, will change based off of the personnel we have. Awesome coach. Um, how has COVID modified your spring and summer in terms of install, working with your kids, uh, reaching out? Like, how have you been forced to adapt? We're blessed that we've had relatively consistent uh, uh, carryover within coaches. Um, you know, our, we did get um, one of our, our co-defensive coordinators took over as defensive coordinator because our defensive coordinator took a job at South Dakota State. Um, but that scheme is going to stay the same. My scheme is going to stay the same. I have a, several really good friends that just took over programs this offseason. I, I can't even imagine um, what they had to go through. So for us, uh, we were able to do install meetings, but it wasn't drastically new stuff to the kids, right? It wasn't like mind-blowing stuff. It was more or less review for them. And, uh, and, and so I think that that stress level wasn't the same for us that it may be for um, some other programs that were installing something new or, you know, we're, we're truly new to the program, if you will. Uh, this summer has been a little bit more difficult, right? Um, because you want to see, uh, you want to see progress from young men. Like we can't be out on the field with them, but it's nice to be in the office and see guys working their way to the field after after a workout right and just that that's just fun to to watch the progress throughout the summer um as as we pass these guys in town or, or on campus and, and we're just not have we're not able to do that right now right like we don't have uh, our weight rooms not open we don't have a high number of guys in town not like we normally do so that's been a little bit challenging um as a offensive coaching staff we worked we 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 busted i mean we were ultra, ultra active in the months of uh, late March and uh, April and then into May. And then mm, middle to late May, um, we've been, you know, our head coach, Coach Bullis said, hey, you guys got to, you got to chill. You got to, you got to take, take a breath because when we get back, when we, when we hit it, whenever we hit it, it's going to be crazy. And so we're, the month of June was, everybody was sort of doing their own thing. It's usually a camp month for us anyway, right, where we're not doing a whole lot of true schematics um people are out doing you know going to see all these different showcase camps and whatnot um so that's we sort of held that true that we weren't going to be ultra active as far as 
scheme stuff in June. And now we're um, now we're into July and past the 4th of July. We're, we're starting to dial it back up. We're lucky that we are able to, as long as we socially distance, be in the office um, so we can meet in larger rooms and um, and where that's allowable. So it's it, we're, we're starting to wean off the Zoom stuff a little bit. So that's that's positive as well. Awesome, Coach. Now, now kind, kind of get in the – talk a little bit back – get back to normalcy a little bit. How do you normally install? What is your philosophy on how much you put in a day, how many days? Like what is your ideal – schedule kind of look like so my ultimate goal is that by the eighth day of install we are fully installed for uh that we could feel we would feel confident playing a week one opponent and we do that um first of all we keep things very simple we keep things we try to stay very as basic as we can so that our our players can learn it and they can play fast and physical and disciplined um but my whole goal is that on day seven we are installing our red zone package so that if we had to play on day eight, we could. Uh, I also work very, very hard to have the first three days of install super easy so that for the freshman offensive linemen and freshman quarterbacks uh, or transfer linemen and transfer quarterbacks. Because as an offense, and I think everybody can sort of attest to this, traditionally you feel a little bit behind the defense. Um, so it, it not, you know, that we could go into the why that is right. But it's just a little bit harder to get in sync on offense than it is on defense early in camp. And so it's our job though, to give the defense a look, right? We can't go out there and have a quarterback opening up the wrong way an offensive lineman step in the wrong direction because that doesn't help our defense progress. So we focus, uh, we focus and are very intent on making sure that our quarterbacks and our young quarterbacks and young offensive linemen can, uh, can truly participate and compete days one through three that uh, that allows the defense to progress that allows the other players on the field to progress um but then it also gives those young guys confidence right they they feel like oh shoot i can do this uh i i early on in my coaching career i i had a much different philosophy it was sort of the sink or swim thing and you'd see these young quarterbacks who had hyper talented arms and and they'd go almost into a shell because you weren't helping them develop and giving them any amount of confidence immediately they need that immediate feedback that immediate conf- boost of confidence and then you have it. they're engaged and yeah maybe days five and six when you're starting to get to you know true five-step drop stuff and, and hot routes and checks maybe they're maybe they're swimming in right or sinking in but they feel confident they still remember hey i i, I can i can do this i had this right and you can go back and show them positive clips so the way we do that is well, our base install starts with inside zone uh, and my, I think the, the thought process behind that is if you're a young offensive lineman who's never ran his own play or doesn't know, uh, what we're doing or doesn't know the combos at the very least on inside zone, if you step right, when you're supposed to step right, right. If it's 14, which is our inside zone to the right. If you step right, even if you don't know who you're comboing to, you got a shot. <laughs> you have an, at least a shot at do at, at making a, a successful block. Right. And uh, same same idea within pass pro. So we start with all of our slide protection stuff for the first three days, whether that's power pass, three step, or hitch naked. Because ideally, or hypothetically, if you're a slide protection as offensive lineman, if you know you have to step right, and you still don't, you don't know anything else, don't know any other combo, don't don't know where we're working to. At least in the slide protection, if you step right, you got a shot. And uh, that's been really good for our young guys. Really, really good for our young guys. And that also keeps the reads very simple for the quarterbacks when you're looking at power pass, three-step drop or quick game and hitch naked where basically it's a flood concept or it's some type of attack the curl flat defender. And most young quarterbacks, most freshmen transfers for sure have seen that, uh, have seen concepts like that in high school. It's not reinventing the wheel with a levels concept or um, a mesh concept or whatever it may be. Okay. Um, what, 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 when you're installing every year, what typically is your biggest hurdles? I mean, outside of obviously new kids and freshmen, do you have consistent hurdles or is there something new that kind of just pops up every year? Um, getting enough looks at the number of defensive fronts we're going to see. Uh, that is that is the number one issue. Um, we do a thing called team versus cones where we set up uh, three different defensive fronts just with cones and one group will rep through it. So they'll see an even split box. They'll see an odd stack box. Then they'll see an odd split box. 
and they'll have to run the same run play against all three fronts because you just can't get enough reps if you're trying to throw bodies out there, trying to get a scout team out there. And what the number of fronts we see in the WEAC and throughout the course of the season, and truly even when I was at Rhodes, the number of fronts we saw in, in the SAA, I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. You can't focus two full weeks of camp on an even front and then go practice one week on an odd front to get ready for your game, right? And I think some people fall into that, that trap of, well, this is the look I'm going to see during fall camp again from my defense, so let's learn how to – let's block that up really well. Um, and then all of a sudden you get into week two or three and you're seeing a completely different front. You have to almost reinstall your entire run game. So we, we install our run game against every single front we think we could see. We say we're going to see five or six fronts throughout the course of this, or we can categorize uh, fronts into, I think we have it as six fronts. Um, and so we're going to work on all six of those fronts uh, throughout the course of camp. Okay, coach. Um, my, my next question is what, what do you typically – in a normal game week, what do you typically focus on in terms of situations? I mean, obviously, you can't practice every situation in a week. It's just not time-wise, it can't. But what, are, what, what, in your opinion, are your priority situations that you have to practice? Uh, so we, we practice third down. We practice uh, red zone. We practice two minutes. Um, what we, I try to focus on a lot during camp, though, is putting my quarterback or our quarterback in as many adverse situations as possible. So we do very little open script uh, play calls during camp because that's not what you're going to see in a game. Why are we just running a bunch of first and 10 calls, right? Like there's a time for that, but during camp, we're trying to make the quarterback as uncomfortable as he can with some of these situations so we can teach it, right? It's third and five. You're on the 25 yard line going in. What do you want him to do as a coach, right? Do you want him to try to force something in? Do you want him to, to, to throw it away? Do you have, to have confidence in your field goal kicker that he can hit a 42-yarder? I mean, like, you, those are the conversations that you can have when you have situational football during camp. So that when we get to the season, we're still working third down and we're still working red zone and we're still working these, um, these different, those different situations. But it's not as big of an emphasis because, again, we're now installing or installing, but fine-tuning our plays, our run game, our pass game, to the defensive looks we're going to see. So we can, we can allow our quarterback to focus a little bit more on read keys than maybe the situational, the situational piece. One thing we are going to do this year, and I, I, this is the beauty of the, one of the only great things about COVID is there was a ton of collaboration amongst coaches, right? Um, but uh, one thing I heard this offseason and I love is scripting and looking at sec, uh, second and long and treating second and long as its own category. And we haven't done that, but – I think that that's an awesome, could be an awesome um, advantage for us uh, moving forward. So we will actually, um, this next season, we're going to break down second and long and we're going to put a second and long call, uh, call sheet together. We're going to practice our second and long calls and we're going to, uh, I'm going to have that on my game plan. Now, now you mentioned right there, I mean, kind of one thing you picked up during this weird, horrible COVID period. Um, but what, what else during this odd time have you spent time learning or using this professional development to help improve you and your program during this time it can be on and all or off the field stuff man i got like i got three notebooks full of stuff that that i've learned um the the i know it sounds um maybe a cop out but the second and long stuff i thought was was great um i've talked to, to a ton of people about overage and just what they how much overage they're going to take into a game because that is so important to me why are you practicing a play that you know, 10 times during the week that you don't plan on calling, but once or twice during a game, that doesn't make sense, right? That's, that's too expensive of a play to carry. Um, so we've talked to a lot of people about that. Um, we looked at a lot of play action stuff. Um, I thought uh, this past year, our play action game was fine. It wasn't as good as it probably should have been. Um, so we looked at a lot of play action stuff. And then um, truly a lot of things just got reiterated that, yeah, you're, Maybe we could make a small tweak to this idea or small tweak to that idea, but you're on the right path. And, and that's what I, I love the most sometimes. It's like, okay, I'm not crazy. This is a good idea. It does work. We just got to give it a little tweak. Coach, is there anything in practice or in scouting you think you guys do that's unique that other people might not do or might not think of do? Um, so we will, when we're looking, when we're breaking down film, we're going to pull out all, all the um, abnormal downs, if you will, or exceptional downs. 
So any extremely large, long yarded situations, any third downs, any fourth downs, any um, anything inside the red zone, when we're just building our gate base game plan, I think a decent number of people do that. But uh, again, we're going to pull out our second and longs as well because we're, we are, you know, we went back and looked at, um, we went back and looked at the second and longs, and there is a difference in what defensive uh, coordinators are calling. So we're going to look more at just tr uh, true open calls. So first and ten. First and five, first and fifteen, whatever it may be, just basic first down calls, and then the base second down calls where it's you know second and uh, six or less. Um, that will be our base, and then we're everything else is going to form its own playlist, and we'll look at those uniquely and individually to um, to put together a unique game plan for each of those. So that that might be a little bit different for some people. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to grade the efficiency. I'm I'm really into efficiency and and I, I like it. if you can back something up with numbers that makes me so much happier just as a person like it just i don't know i don't know why that makes <laughs> me feel better but i'm not a subject i i think because i am such a subjective guy in everyday life that i like to be objective in my um and and, and have some concrete stuff in football but concrete evidence but uh we're gonna look at the defensive efficiency against previous opponents meaning you know we're we're supposed to open up with carthage this year we're actually going to look at um, uh, the three previous opponents or the three films that we have and grade the efficiency of their defense versus certain schemes. So, so that we can see if inside zone is efficient 53% of the time, then maybe inside zone something we really need to carry, you know, or, you know, we love, we love power up here, right? Pound the rock. Um, but they're, you know, shoot they're nails against power that's they're 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 hitting it they're, it's a only 34 percent efficient um and we might say oh let's be wary of power but we're going to actually grade the efficiency of a defense to try to find weaknesses and we're going to do that with each of our opponents and i'm really excited to see to see where that comes back now you mentioned grading efficiency how much do you then self-scout and see how efficient uh, you are you very all every weekly you know Sunday. We don't. We probably need to self scout a little bit more, but I would say we self scout a more than more than most. I shouldn't say we should. We probably could self scout a little bit more, but we're, we're really intrigued in that with that. Whether it's back alignment, whether it's efficiency, um, you know, because there's a lot of plays that look great on paper, right? And you put it into you put it into practice, it looks awesome. And you call it in a game, and the first time you call it, it hits, and then you keep going back to it throughout the course of a game. But you remember that one time it hit. And you get the and you get the data and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we what are we doing? That's a wasted play call, right? It's a wasted play call. But then the key is too, you can't just say that something's inefficient and drop it. You need to go back and evaluate that film and see why it's inefficient. Is it inefficient because it had because you had three drops? Is it inefficient because your quarterback didn't have a clean pocket two of the three times? Why didn't he have a clean pocket? Are you asking too much of the offensive line? Is it just was it just bad luck? Um, because in the same sentence, you can drop a play that's a really good play because you didn't go back and watch the film. You only looked at the data. Uh, kind of last football-related question, Coach. Um, what advice would you give a first-time offensive coordinator based off what you've learned over the past couple of years? I, yeah, I got a couple pieces of that. Um, have a <laughs> why to every play call. I think too many times people are calling a play and they couldn't tell you why. Why did you call a wide zone? Why did you call power? Why did you call pin and pull? Whatever it may be, right? The why. You got to have a why. If you're just calling plays, well, you can have a, you can have your phone call a dang play because you just put a randomizer on and just you can pop it out, right? <laughs> you mean, oh, hey, inside zone. Oh, phone says run levels, right? Um, so have a why, and then remember that simpler is most always better like there's no two ways about it simpler is being more simple does not hurt it, it's almost always a better option okay coach and then last question because i know people, anybody who watches this i i will not be forgiven if i don't ask it um obviously uh, wh why all the star wars stuff in the background i love all of them even the phantom menace <laughs> oh. like, i know i i said it it's out there um, I don't know. I grew up on Star Wars. Like that was what we watched. I, I actually grew up on a farm once we moved uh, from New Jersey out to Iowa, and so like we didn't have cable for a long time. We just had a bunch of VHSs that were double dubbed from uh, I think our local rental store. Don't don't tell anybody, but uh, 
So, you know, there was a limited selection, I think, and, and um, four, five, and six for Star Wars uh, were, were always uh, right around the tape player, and I think they just got shoved in a lot. And so I, I grew up loving it. My Truly, by both, ki- both my kids are named after Star Wars characters. My son is Ben, and after Ben Kenobi, and then uh, my daughter's named Mara, after Mara Jade, who's in the books, but I think she's now legend and not canon. So I don't know if we'll ever see her in a movie or a show, but yeah. Oh. I'm a Star Wars nerd at heart. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, at Coach. Hey, we all got to love, and I, and I was the same way. I, that's probably those three movies, and there's like one or two sports movies, VHS-wise. I was just popping over and over as a kid, so <laughs> yep. I, I know. And that dreaded rewind sound of v, VCR. <laughs> so, Coach, um, thank you. I appreciate you taking time out of your day today, and I wish you, your family, safety and health, and luck this season. Hey, thank you, Coach. You, same to you, and I appreciate the time. This is awesome.